Welcome back to Personal Pension Radio. Yes, something different again. It's taking me a little while to get to episode 240. I've been planning out again how I'm going to continue to work the podcast into my schedule. With the coronavirus, the COVID-19 situation, and all of the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, we have been so busy. I'm grateful to be not only a certified financial planner to help people on the financial side of our house, I'm also grateful to be a paralegal on the law firm side of our operation. So I have been really busy. It's great. And I love the connections I've made with you, the listeners, folks out there in podcast land. Hello, wherever you are. I really appreciate the opportunity to connect. Also been just busy with clients and busy with introductions from the alliance partners that we have. We have alliance partners all over the country, CPAs, attorneys, other insurance advisors, other financial advisors and financial planners, and podcast planning has been a challenge. The other thing is that right now in Southern California where I'm recording, you can see that I'm clearly not in the workshop. Uh, I actually am trying to figure out how to podcast through the summer because sometimes it's just so hot when I get around to actually recording rather than cranking up the air conditioner in my shop, which I'm thankful I have. I just figured I need to find a way to do something different and continuing on the theme of doing some more video. I've got this great setup uh, here in my home so I figured let's put it to work. Let's use it. So for those of you who are new to the show, yes, I am Craig Strom. I am the income engineer. And yes, for those of you who have asked recently, I do actually own the nationally registered trademark as the income engineer. I am not an attorney. I am not a certified public accountant. I am a certified financial planner professional. I actually have to say it in that particular order. All that and how cool this might look and sound, please don't act on things that you hear on my show as if you're hearing for advice for you personally. Please seek out the advice, I hope, of a certified financial planner. Please, goodness me, don't take advice from financial entertainers. Financial entertainers are people like Dave Ramsey who have radio shows and no business giving out financial advice in 30 second and one minute sound bites. Please do yourself a favor. Meet with a qualified, certified financial planner. Go over your specific situation before you start moving down a path to take action. And yes, I am unabashedly and on video raising my hand to say I would love to be that financial planner uh, that you sit down and talk with. And in the age of technology nowadays, I meet with folks all over the country through the miracle of Zoom meetings. So we have meetings all the time now um, with our work, with our clients. We, we meet with folks all over the country. So if you'd like to get in touch, you can always send me an email. That's Craig with a K at CraigStrom.com. Craig with a K at CraigStrom.com. Now, I want to jump in today. Actually, I, I promised that I would share a deal of the week with a client of mine who listens to the show. And my deal of the week, because I am actually switching over to a new format for recording, is actually this microphone. Someone asked me recently how I do my podcast and they want to do their own podcast and get set up and so forth. And he asked me a variety of questions, but a lot of them focused on tech. Uh, what kind of microphone should I buy? And I read this blog that says I should buy this one. And I read this one that says I should buy that one. Here's the thing. When I first started this uh, podcast 239 episodes ago, I did all that research as well. This was several years ago, and I have to tell you, I was blown away by how much I could spend on doing a podcast at the time. It could be really expensive. One of the common themes that I heard, that I read consistently, was the most important thing that you can have in your podcast is good audio quality first. 
audio quality was the number one thing. And then if you're going to do video, video quality, as, uh, as, as I'm hopefully coming through okay on the video. But audio quality was the big deal. So I researched microphones. Long story short, a number of the big time podcasters were recording on Heil microphones, several different microphone styles that were three, four, five hundred dollars was the microphone that continued to come up and be recommended. And several times I read that the Audio Technica ATR 2100, yeah, I remember it because I've told people about it 50, 50 times. The Audio Technica ATR 2100, this microphone right here, was on sale Amazon.com with a variety of accessories, the windsock. It came with other things that I don't actually use. And I bought this boom arm that isolates the microphone to keep it from uh, transmitting any vibrations when I move the boom. All of that, 75 bucks. $75 versus $500 for the one that was most commonly recommended at the time when I bought it. Now, there's a million of them out there today. I would say, though, that it's still that $500 price point. You'll see, oh, this is the one you've got to have. It's amazing. Well, I would challenge anyone, because I challenge myself, I would challenge anyone to listen to a $500 podcast mic and listen to my, actually this thing was 50 bucks, 50 bucks and then the boom was $25 or something like that. So this is a 50 to $60 microphone and listen to the sound quality and it sounds great. It comes across just fine. It sounds really good, nice and clear directional mic. So my deal of the week is my Audio Technica microphone for $75 total with the boom, that's a 560%, 67% savings. So for 567% less, I got a really good quality microphone and a boom to go with it to do my podcast. And then uh, I'll probably go through some of my other podcast tech uh, on another episode because a lot of folks have emailed me, a lot of listeners have emailed me, friends asking, how do I do the podcast? That sounds really expensive. No, it's not really expensive at all. Now, I want to start with the next, the, the first segment of my show is watch your step. Watch your step. And today, I actually want to share a, a series I have enough of them. I'm going to share a series of my own personal mistakes, my own personal missteps, so you can hopefully benefit from those missteps that I've taken, and I call those lessons learned. And I am so tired, so many times I am tired, tired, tired of learning lessons, but you got to keep learning, right? That's it. You just got to keep learning. So I'm going to share some of my personal mistakes in the Watch Your Step series, if you will. I don't know. I've got so many personal financial mistakes. I want you to know as the listener, I want you to know that I am absolutely human, just like everybody else. Uh, if you've got a financial planner out there that doesn't admit to his or her mistakes, they are not being genuine. Every one of us are human beings. We are susceptible to making mistakes. So I want to share some of my personal mistakes uh, so that, and these are things that I consider to be mistakes, right? I consider these to be my mistakes. Some folks may not look at them in the same way, and they might not, they might not think of them as mistakes. Let's just, I'll just say that. So the first one I want to share is actually one that, that came up recently with a personal client. Let's say personal client where he had actually reached out to me regarding buying a car versus leasing a car. Buying a car versus leasing a car. Now, there are situations where leasing a car makes sense. From a business perspective, most of the time, um, I'm saying business perspective is usually when it makes sense. It is not always right, whether it's a business transaction or not. I am not a fan of leasing a car. Essentially, renting a car long term in a 
really expensive and complicated, confusing manner that is set up to benefit the dealership, uh, that's, that's just rot with problems, right? There's, there's pitfalls all through there. So this client called and we talked and I encouraged him to avoid, in his situation, avoid leasing a car. I encouraged him to seek out a, a low interest rate certified pre-owned purchase of a car, perhaps. Well, what he did was he went to the dealership on a weekend, got all excited about a car, got completely hornswoggled into a lease, and now has himself a three-year lease on a vehicle and a lease that he completely doesn't understand, has no idea what he signed. He doesn't know anything about lease negotiations. Now, full disclosure, neither do I. I have a car dealership license, means I can buy and sell cars at dealer auctions, and, and I really have a passion for cars. If you asked me to guide you through leasing a car, Oh, I would have to seriously sit down and put on my thinking cap and really go through and be very careful about studying lease 101 because leasing is an extremely specific type of car or vehicle acquisition. It's, it's essentially set up to benefit the dealerships and the finance companies. It's got all kinds of pitfalls in a lease contract. And this guy called me. I said, whoa, you shouldn't lease. Oh, the payments are so high if I finance it. Well, he went in and got, I'm going to say it. He got suckered, hornswoggled into a lease because it sounded good and we'll give you money for your trade-in and yada, 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 and a low payment and sounds good. Well, now that he looks at his lease and he came back and we touched base on it and I asked him some questions about his lease that he didn't know, he went back and looked at it and he went, oh, 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 right? So he did not understand the full scope of what he had signed. Now, I mentioned that this is my personal mistake section of uh, Watch Your Step, and that's exactly what it is because uh, my, the second vehicle purchase of my life Long time ago, when I was young, I did the exact same thing. I went into a Honda dealership, a Honda dealership, Norm Reeves Honda in California, and I got so sold into a lease on a Honda Civic LX. The lease is so is full of things that you can negotiate. That's the part that most people don't understand, that a lease is a contract you can negotiate. You can specifically negotiate certain aspects of the contract, but you have to understand leasing. You have to really understand leasing to make sure that you know what you can and what you can't negotiate. I knew nothing. Just like my client recently, I knew nothing. I went in and I signed like, oh my gosh, I get to drive out of here with this car for $250 a month, this is amazing. Well, I didn't understand the mileage, I didn't understand the built-in interest rate, I didn't understand the various different components, I didn't understand the gap coverage, I understood nothing. The lease turned out to be a terrible, terrible thing and I ended up having that car like a weight around my neck for a number of years beyond the lease because it was so terrible. It was good for the dealer, terrible for the, the actual customer. So my first watch your step is if you're going to purchase a vehicle, remember that leasing a vehicle is not purchasing a vehicle. It is essentially renting a car and it could be an extremely expensive rental. If you're the type of person who really likes to have a new car every two to three years, uh, you know, that, you know, you want to keep that look and that image and maybe you want to run it through your business as an expense, leasing can work. What I would encourage you to do, though, is Google it. Really Google it. You can actually go to YouTube and there are some really detailed uh, videos from car experts on how to negotiate a lease on a car. Learn that and negotiate the lease. 
Now, one really important thing that I would encourage you to always remember, whether you're buying or leasing, is negotiate with the dealership on the price of the car first. Do not negotiate whether you're financing, paying cash, or leasing. That is not your first negotiation. Your first negotiation, number one priority, is to settle and agree on the sale price of the vehicle regardless of how you're going to buy it. And then, you talk about maybe a trade-in. Never bring up the idea of a trade-in until you have settled on the actual purchase price of the vehicle. Then talk about trade-in, then discuss lease, then discuss finance, now that you've settled on the established value of the vehicle. So that's my watch your step. I'll have some more because Oh, goodness knows I've got a ton of personal mistakes that uh, I can share and I want to share those so that you can watch your step as well. Now, listener question actually came in, but before I do that, last time I had tons of questions. Uh, I, I had had tons of questions about living trusts and powers of attorney and estate plans and what's it all mean. I went through a pretty deep dive in episode 239 on the last episode if you have questions about living trusts and wills and powers of attorney and which is which and why should you get this or that, please listen to episode 239 and send me an email anytime, craig at craigstrom.com. I am happy to help. And uh, as a paralegal, I love that I can actually help take people through the estate planning process and get your wills and powers of attorney all done. Uh, it's truly one of the things that I enjoy about my work. Now, this time... Listener Jeff, uh, hello, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for this question. Listener Jeff said this. Uh, I'm going to read it uh, off on my screen here behind the camera. He says, my parents own a cabin on a big piece of land in Northern California. Well, first of all, that's awesome. There's not too many big pieces of land available in California. So when I first read this, I thought it must be rustic. And, of course, then he goes on to say this. It was passed down from my grandparents to my mom and dad, and they plan to leave it to my sister and I. It is very rustic, and the cabin is all original. So, sounds like it's been there for a long time. I have listened to your show for a long time, and I've heard you talk. Thank you, by the way, for listening. I really, I've really, i I've met a number of people on Zoom and email lately that have listened uh, from very early days of my show. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so... The idea here is that the cabin has been around for a long time. This, this person says, I've heard you talk about protection. So Jeff says, I've heard you talk about protection as a first priority. I asked my parents about the insurance they have on the cabin, and I was surprised to find out that they do not have it insured at all. They have no insurance at all. My dad said that his parents never had insurance because it was paid for and they were not in a fire danger area. Okay, little side note for me. I did not know there was a place in Southern California or Northern California that wasn't a fire danger area. Uh, the, the sad running joke when people call me from, uh, you know, family back east and such is uh, that, um, yes, we are on fire, right? In California, we're on fire and it wasn't riots. It was, uh, it was just... The, the riverbed uh, near my home is burning or up uh, near Los Angeles, up in the canyon is burning. We're always on fire. So, sorry, that was just a little uh, Southern California or California side note. Um, so, Jeff had said that his parents didn't have it covered because the house was paid for and it wasn't, it wasn't in a fire danger area, right? So, I find that hard to believe personally on the fire damage area, uh, fire risk area, right? But Jeff goes on to say this, it's kind of off grid, but do you think I should encourage my parents to get insurance on the property? Okay, now that's good. That's Thank you, Jeff, by the way, for the question. This is an excellent question, and I've seen it, sadly, way too many times. Way too many times with something similar to this. So... I'm going to share a story. This is a true story of my family, uh, a personal experience just last year, just, just one year back in the summer. So my family, we went on vacation 
and rented a cabin on a lake in Maine, New England, where I grew up, and a set of stairs down in the basement, a set of stairs that was built by the homeowner, right? The person who owns the cabin built the stairs. So not a contractor, um, not, you know, not a construction person, not a licensed fabricator of stairs, but the homeowner built the stairs. That's important because those stairs collapsed under my nephew. As my nephew went into the basement to bring in the trash, to put the trash down in the basement, keep it away from the raccoons and the minks and all the various critters that are out there in the, on the lake, he crashed three feet onto the floor of this basement, surrounded by splinters, nails, uh, metal, the water pump system. Thankfully, really truly blessed, that he was not severely and permanently damaged. He had some major bruising, some pretty good cuts and gashes, but nothing that required him going to the hospital. He was really sore for a few days, but he was not permanently damaged. Had he been permanently damaged, had he been permanently injured, my sister would have no choice she would most likely have to file a claim against these folks that we've rented a cabin from for years. These are friendly people. But if my nephew had been permanently damaged, ongoing medical, major issues, she would have had to sue. And if they didn't have the correct insurance, one of their primary assets worth nearly $300,000 is the cabin on the lake. And if they don't have proper insurance in that situation, my sister might end up owning the cabin on the lake, right? So now back to Jeff's question. Should, they encourage, should he encourage his parents to get insurance on the cabin? I think you understand what I'm about to say is yes. Heck yes. Oh my gosh, yes. In California, we have a homestead exemption limit that says that homeowners are exempt up to $100,000 of, of the value of their property is protected in the event of a lawsuit. $100,000, okay? So what is that? $100,000, right? So $100,000. If it's more than $100,000, let's say a civil liability or a claim, well, you're out of luck if you don't have the right insurance. So here's the example I want to give you. The example is this. Let's say you have this cabin. It's off grid. Maybe it has a septic system, uh, but it has running water from a well. It has plumbing. So one day you need a plumber to come out and work on uh, updating the pipes in a kitchen or a bathroom or whatever it might be, right? And that plumber falls through the floorboards, old floorboards in an old cabin. It's a pretty heavy duty plumber and he falls through the floorboards and he's permanently disabled. He's not dead, he's not paralyzed, but he's unable to actually use his hand, right? He, he compound, this is true stories, by the way, I'm just overlaying it on Jeff's story. These are situations that I've seen that we've seen at our law firm, okay? That the, the plumber is permanently disabled. Compound fracture of his hand severs nerves and he's no longer able to really use his hand with the dexterity that he needs to be a plumber. He is no longer able to be a plumber. Fell through the floor of an old cabin in California, right? Well now, he has to sue because he has now lost his wages. He had another 10 years, minimum of 10 years left to work. He makes $80,000 a year plus medical bills. What do you think the lawsuit's gonna come out to? probably in the neighborhood of 900,000 to a million dollars. So without proper insurance on that cabin, that plumber will own the cabin now. And the cabin I'm sure is not worth a hundred grand. A cabin on a sizable piece of land in California, no matter what, is probably worth a half a million dollars, minimum. So the plumber now owns the cabin because the judgment was a million dollars, and of course, mom and dad probably don't have a million dollars to hand over. So yeah, that's a problem. 
That's one major example. And then here again, another true story. This is a really tough situation, but you have to really, you have to put yourself in these situations and say, okay, well, yeah, it never, it hasn't happened to me at this point. It never happened to my grandparents. Okay, we got lucky so far, but will you and your sister, Jeff, be the ones to be lucky again for another 15 or 20 years? Who knows, right? But this is a situation where one of the grandchildren comes to the cabin for the weekend and brings a friend, brings a little friend. And so the little friend and the grandchild, they're out there playing in the old tree house in the back field and the tree house collapses. And this time, this time the injuries are severe. This time the injuries are really bad and that little girl has got some major, major physical therapy. She's going to recover, but there's no timeline on how long it's going to take her to recover. She's had a pretty good head injury. She's not paralyzed, thank goodness, but there's going to be some serious physical therapy and long-term recovery. Once again, Mom and dad of that little girl, the friend that granddaughter brought over to the family ca cottage, the family cabin, right? Nobody would have thought that could happen, but that little girl's parents have to sue mom and dad, and mom and dad have a $100,000 limit on their homestead exemption for California. So guess what? That little girl's parents, they own the cabin, right? That's how it works. The judgment will be in favor of the plaintiff. They will then be forced to sell or basically turn over the house, the cabin, and then that little girl's parents will sell that cabin to help pay for her medical bills. That's how it works. So the answer to the question is, yes, 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 get insurance. The, the bottom line is, get insurance on everything that you can. It is the least expensive, most efficient way for you to protect yourself in, in a search, uh, search uh, let me get my words right, in a situation like this, right? Get insurance first, bottom line, right? Successful doctor, story here. Successful doctor, no insurance on the motorcycles that he rides on the weekend. If he runs into somebody and injures somebody on his dirt bike, his dirt bikes were not covered by any of his insurance policies, right? Insure everything that you might own, drive, use, anything that could possibly come up where somebody gets injured on that thing or by that thing, get it covered. How's this one? CEO, CEO of a $20 million business here in California. Great, great all-American story where she started a business and she is just cranking it. Awesome. Well, guess what? The golf cart... She drives around her gated community on a golf cart. It's so cool. Everybody can say hi and wave at each other. It's great. Golf cart, not insured. If she ran into somebody, if she hurt a child, if she damaged something on her golf cart, and I say damaged something like a person, she's not covered. Not at all. Her golf cart's not covered. Silly, but get it covered. How about this one? This was a final one, and then I'm gonna wrap up with a quick reminder on Insurance 101. 30 year, 30 year, 30 year veteran CPA, right? She has had a just a great run as a CPA, and one of her vacation slash someday retirement planning ideas involves the houseboat that she keeps in Arizona. She loves her houseboat in Arizona. And she doesn't rent it. She's the only one who uses it. But she re uh, regularly invites friends and family to come over to the houseboat. Not insured. She hadn't really thought about it. I asked the question. I said, so you have your cars insured and home insured and your houseboat insured? And she got a little, little quiet. She said, I don't, I don't know if I have a policy on my houseboat. Oh, my gosh. She has a policy on her houseboat now. Folks. Insure everything you possibly can. And a quick reminder about insurance. Maximum liability available. That should be your first priority. Whatever the maximum available is. Yeah, for example, on cars, maximum liability coverage is usually $500,000. $500,000. On your house, $500,000 is often the maximum base liability that you can get. 
then make sure if you have a car, uninsured motorist should be at least $500,000. Uninsured motorist, at least $500,000. And then let's talk about deductibles. On your home, for example, would you really call the insurance company to file a claim if the repair on your home was going to cost $4,212. Gosh, I hope you don't call the insurance company for a $4,212 claim. Because if your state where you're listening to this is anything like California, if you file a claim twice, twice on a property, it's very likely that your insurance company is going to cancel you. They do not like claims. I'm telling you, they're there to pay the claim and that's fine, but you really want to keep your homeowners and your auto insurance for the big ticket items, the big ticket situations where you really want that coverage. Okay. So if you wouldn't file a claim for less than $5,000 on your home, why not have a $5,000 deductible? If you have a $5,000 deductible, what happens to your premium? Your premium goes down. If you have a $2,500 deductible versus five, ask your insurance carrier, what's the premium difference? You might really like that extra drop in premium. Go see another movie when we finally get out of lockdown, right? Get your deductibles right. And on your car, same thing. Why would anybody have a $250 deductible? I have encouraged some clients who have very expensive collections and really good cash in the bank, emergency money, to have $1,000, $2,500 deductibles on their automobiles. Business auto fleets, $2,500 deductible minimum. If you have a business cars, if you have a fleet of cars for business, maximum deductibles. You don't ever want to file a claim unless it is seriously necessary. And then you'll pay the $5,000 or $2,500 deductible and the insurance comes in and covers you. So maximum deductibles. Now, that's going to wrap it up for today. If you have questions about your personal insurance, your protection, your life insurance, car insurance, disability insurance, send me an email, craig at craigstrom.com, craig at craigstrom.com, and we'll get together, review your personal situation. Remember, I am the income engineer and maximum retirement income planning, for example, it starts with proper protection. You've got to make sure that you are safe and protected on your way to the best lifestyle you can get in retirement. I'll talk to you again soon. Take care.